Yo, what up? Welcome back to another episode of the YouTube show where the dog has more character development than the host. Well, I know it, and you know it. Everybody gangsta until they get their film back and it's underexposed. That alone will make a grown man break down into tears, cursing the heavens above. I know because I did it in last week's episode and only just stopped crying this morning. I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of people foolishly requested a video on how I meter for my film photography work. So get ready, I'm about to drop a huge dump of information about metering right on the screen in front of you. Metering is the reading of the light in a scene and is a very important part of the film photography game. It can be the deciding factor of whether your shot is hot garbage or simply great. It can be the deciding factor when you print your image and your parents hang it up on the fridge instead of rolling it up and beating you with it. So. Yeah, this video is going to be about how I meter for film. I'm definitely not a professional, so this video won't be necessarily the technically correct way or the easiest way, but it's how I've been doing it all these years, and so far it's been working. First up, you'll need a light meter of some kind. A lot of cameras have light meters built into their viewfinders, but sometimes they won't be working correctly due to age. Like how I'm 28 years old and won't work correctly after two Apple teenies. Alternatively, you can use a light meter on your phone. This is the one I use quite a bit and so far so good. Though the one small thing that I've noticed about this app is that all the money from my checking account disappeared after I downloaded it, but it's probably just a coincidence. You can also go the more accurate route and purchase a handheld light meter like the one I have here, a Siconic L608. Lastly, if you have a digital camera, this can also be used to meter if you match the settings on both cameras. But we won't be diving into that method because I've never done it before. Also, f digital cameras. Right, gang? So, big brain abstract thinking time. When I meter, I generally think of a histogram like the one we have here in Lightroom, which displays our image's brightness and color information. With your image's dark slash shadow information here on the left, your mids here in the middle, and highlights here on the right. There are two popular types of metering, spot reflective and incident metering. Three types if you count randomly guessing, which is what all the pros do. 99% of the time I'm using spot metering, which is when the light meter reads the light that is reflected off of an object or an area. In this case, when you get a reading, your light meter is telling you the settings you need to use to get your object or area that you metered for to the midtones on your histogram. For example, if I choose to spot meter a reading off this gorgeous Shrek Barbie here and read the light reflected off her dress, it tells me 1 8th of a second at f4. That means if I use these settings on my camera and lens, that area on her dress will be exposed to the midtones of my image, with shadows and highlights falling off in either direction from there. If I meter for something darker, the information on the histogram will shift to the right as we get more information falling into the mids and highs. If I meter for the highlights, the darker information in the histogram will shift to the left down into the shadows. When there's an abundance of light during the day, I typically try and work towards a bright and airy kind of pastel look. I achieve this look by overexposing my color negative film by one or two stops, or by 32 stops, if you truly aren't afraid of anything. In photography, a stop is a certain measurement of light. In reality, stop is a term used by my coworkers to get me to shut up about how cool I think Willem Verbeek and Matt Day are. If someone were to tell you to overexpose your image by one stop, what they're essentially telling you is to double the amount of light that's being exposed to your film. This can be achieved by changing the shutter speed or the f-stop. So going from 1 60th of a second down to 1 30th of a second, or f5.6 to f4. Those are both examples of going one stop brighter. Anyway, when I meter for daytime photos where it's bright, but seems a little brighter because I'm hungover. I generally set the light meter to one and a half stops over box speed. So if I'm shooting portrait 400, one stop overexposed would be 200 and two stops overexposed would be 100 because we're straight up lying to the light meter and telling it we're using less sensitive film. So we need more light. 
For me, one and a half stops means I'll tell the light meter to read for an ISO of 150, though 160 is generally our closest option, which is fine. Next, I'll hone my light meter in on the subject or whatever object or area I want to expose to the midtones and take a reading. If there's no subject in the scene or I can't find any midtones to meter, then typically I zoom my meter all the way out and take a general reading of the entire scene. If I'm using my camera's light meter, I generally just meter the entire scene. Yeah, so pretty simple. That's how I meter for daytime photos. The same kind of technique can be used for overcast photos where the lighting is a bit more diffused. Though generally in those cases, I'll only overexpose my film by half of a stop instead of one and a half stops. Additionally, sunrise or sunset is a good time to shoot because it's free and you get one pretty much every day and it's a good excuse to stare off into the sunset like Luke Skywalker. So how do we get these shots to look fire so that we can appease the sun god Ra or the giant ball of flaming gas in space? Whatever you believe, I guess. So here's the scene I shot at sunset with some of my homies. The way I meter this high contrast situation is pretty simple. Generally, I'll meter for the subject of the image, in this case, the person, and go one stop, maybe even two stops darker from there. So let's hypothetically say the meter reading for the light on the guy here was 1 60th of a second at f2.8. I can make the image two stops darker by changing the shutter speed from 1 60th of a second to 1 250th of a second. By making it one or two stops darker, I could potentially retain more information from the sunset and not lose too much detail in our subject. Additionally, in most cases, I'll shoot sunsets at a half of a stop overexposed. So if I was shooting Portra 400, I'd shoot it at 300 ISO or 320 since that's more common. Honestly though, the best piece of advice I can give you is don't tape pieces of bread to your bare nipples and run through a flock of seagulls. Oh wait, no, that's for a different video. The best piece of advice is simply just bracket your images for sunset. Expose some shots with meter readings of the sunset. Expose some shots with meter readings of the subject. And expose some shots with meter readings in between. Something else to keep in mind is that most color negative film and black and white film actually have pretty good latitude in the highlights and brights, so it's better to overexpose when in doubt. This is where the rules of the game change completely. So take a big old sip of that coffee, tea, water, Red Bull vodka with testosterone powder, whatever it is you're drinking, and spit it out in surprise. Nightscapes are generally considered high contrast scenes, so it can be tough to determine where to take a reading, especially since your handheld light meter can fail if it's too dark. If this happens, the light meter on your phone will do fine as it has better low light capabilities. Yay, technology. Hopefully someday our robot overlords see that I embrace new technology and spare me. So probably the most important thing to take into account for nighttime photography is reciprocity failure, which is a term for how light sensitive chemicals on your film lose sensitivity the longer they're exposed to light. This is generally something we need to be aware of if we're doing an exposure over one second in any situation. However, every film is different. For example, on Kodak's new Ektachrome, reciprocity failure doesn't kick in until after 10 seconds. You can find individual reciprocity curves for whatever film you're using by asking your boy Jeeves for answers. So for nighttime work, I generally try to use exposure to create a sense of isolation and encompassing darkness for the subject. Because I'm still secretly going through my high school goth phase. To get that look, I generally shoot at box speed and meter for the brightest parts of the subject. Now. Remember, when you meter for something directly like that, your light meter is telling you what settings to use to get that object or area exposed to the midtones of your image. So in the case of this toll booth shot, it brought all the highlight information down to the midtones, but it also brought all the shadow information down to the point where any detail around the toll booth was lost. If this were an alternate universe where I was handsome, respected by my peers, and chose to meter for the shadow information of the image, we'd get a fully illuminated scene with lots of detail everywhere, and brighter, potentially even blown out highlights.
What I like to do for a lot of nighttime scenes as well is meter for the brightest parts of the subject and then go one, maybe even two stops brighter if I'm feeling real crazy off that late night Taco Bell Baja Blast. It just hits a little bit differently at night, both going in and Baja blasting out. So an example of writing the exposure one stop brighter would be if I was shooting the window of a house. What's going on in that window or why I've been shooting that specific person, I mean window, for the past five months is irrelevant. So I meter for the light coming through the window and let's just say it's two seconds at f11 on Portra 800. In this case, I'd probably add a stop of light to reveal a tiny bit more shadow information. So I could do that by changing the shutter speed from two seconds to four seconds. Now, reciprocity. Since our shutter time was over one second, we're gonna need to account for reciprocity failure. For this, we're gonna assume a reciprocity factor of about 1.35 because when I asked my boy Jeeves, he wouldn't tell me. Portra 400 has a reciprocity factor of 1.35815, I think. So I think for Portra 800, it's probably a safe guess. So our light meter said four seconds at F11. Let's jump into the calculator on our phone and set four seconds to the power of 1.35. And boom, we get about six and a half seconds, which could probably be rounded to seven seconds for a correct exposure. So that's about it. Uh, as demonstrated, metering is very important to the final look of your image. So it's crucial to understand how it works. This video has been all about how I go about it, which again, might not be the best way or the technically proficient way, but it's how I've been doing it and it's been working. So I hope that this video helped you at least a little bit and maybe you learned something. Like how I'm a grown man who owns a Shrek Barbie doll.